Okay, it looks like we're live. Hello and welcome to Heartrepreneur TV. I am your co-host, Velma Gallant. Super excited to have you here today. We are streaming just a little bit differently than we usually do. Facebook made some changes, so we have to adapt with it as well. I have a very special guest and we're going to have a very fascinating conversation. We almost got into it before we hit live and uh, I zipped yeah. it. <laughs> it sounds like we were saying we almost got into it, but in, a good way. <laughs> but in a good way. We almost got in. We almost, we almost threw down hands, Velma. Um, it was about okay. to go down. <laughs> so, so I'm going to introduce our guest to you today. His name is Neil Twa. He is the CEO, co-founder of Voltage Holdings, a company specializing in launching, consulting, selling, and acquiring brands with a focus on the e-commerce channels such as Amazon, FBA, and multi-channel. More than 15 years of experience as, sell as a selling private as selling private label products on Amazon and his company. So our show title today, I picked it from the ones that he gave me the option to pick because I thought it left me curious. Our topic today is about branding. Don't marry our products. Steal someone else's girlfriend instead. So welcome to the show, Neil. Hi, thanks for having me on. Uh, so yeah, I need to know. I need to know why, why that title? Why are we worrying about stealing somebody else's girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the concept of marrying your product is something that we've discovered over the years is a, a common, uh, I wouldn't call it a failing point. It's a, definitely a hurdle in the business building process that a lot of physical, uh, you know, private label e-commerce building people get caught up in. Uh, and I think it has to do a lot with the, the kind of mindsets we've been shifted into business, this idea that if we, you know, we build this amazing, unique thing, then everyone's going to buy it and all our Lambo hopes and dreams will come true. Uh, when in reality, great businesses are built off of uh, constant change and pivoting and innovation. And mm. so through change and innovation, the idea is that if I can sell a product, even if it's comparable uh, with small customizations to a product already in the market, then I can determine profitability, my ability to sell the product and whether growth and scale are a reality of that product and my market, my share, my time, my business, because frankly, competition doesn't matter if you aren't capable of doing any of it yourself. So I think a lot of people compare themselves to the world and say, well, I must have the best widget. And if I don't, I can't compete in the marketplace. And that's simply not true. So in the time we've got through this, we realized that if people marry their products, they will fail in business. In other words, we have a idea here that you will date your products until your product is worthy of marriage. So, and we're talking about getting married, just so we're clear, but it's marrying the brand, not the products, because each product has a life cycle and all products will go through a certain life cycle of time. And so when do we actually marry? We marry the brand because brand can have lots of different products and it can evolve a long time and brands do not become saturated products do. So when people get in the idea of marrying, they marry their products, they get stuck too long, they hang on to them, they get highly invested in them, they don't know when it's time to divorce the product and move to the next one and they typically hang on too long until it's too late and then she takes your house, your life, your car and wanders off and now you're singing country songs about your dog leaving you too and the family and it's all terrible. Okay. So we don't want anybody any of them there in that place at all. I like that. I like that. It makes it makes a lot of sense because I mean, even in even in marketing, we see that things cycle in and cycle out all the time. Of course, pivots. When one of it, you're supposed to do it this way. Next one, it you're supposed uh -huh. to do it that way. And yeah, I mean, as as an individual, I'm always evolving. Anyway, so I'm not the same person I was five years ago. So well, I was why would not. why would my products necessarily do the same things because the world has changed? All so products. I I really like that. Marry the brand, not the product. So right, right. It doesn't mean we have to divorce them. It just means that we have to grow with them. <laughs> the funny part, yeah, steal somebody else's girlfriend. I, you know, I'm a married spud, but uh, and I have a, a wife and four daughters. So I'm not condoning the idea of infidelity. But what I'm saying is, at the end, there are millions of product opportunities. Don't get caught up in that one product. Will make all your dreams come true. Our methodology is to launch a minimum market test of five products, minimum. And out of those five products, we're expecting a series of data sets and expectations of data to come back from that market test to tell us basically where to put our time, energy, attention, and money properly. So instead of going out and ordering 8,000 units of a product that someone says is going to sell great, and in our mind, we're thinking, boy, if that goes great, I'm going to be able to change my life, you know, buy back my family time and do all those wonderful things I want to do, maybe even retire early. The truth is you've got to learn to sell the first 100 
so that you can anticipate that if I should get 200 or 500 more, I know that it's going to be worth my time, energy, and money to do that, at which point when the data set opens up, if you will, because you're selling in, in a condition of the most difficult aspect of the entire business, you could be using a new account, a new seller, a new process. I'm brand new to this. You could be an existing seller who's trying to revamp your marketing, revamp your process, revitalize your brand and get stuck trying to figure out, well, what the heck do I actually sell? Which is kind of really the first question to ask is, you know, what the heck do I sell or what the bleep do I sell? And who do I sell it to, right? It was just a conditioning and process of learning what e-commerce sellers should actually do. But that's translated into business. Any person who goes into business should understand that business is nothing but a series of daily problem solving. And if you're better at solving the problem or persevering through the problem solving, you will win in the end. So longevity plays a key in both products and brands as well as business and growth as a kind of a holistic aspect to this, not just e-com channel, but literally any business model. And you said it earlier, and the word I would use is pivot. We mm -hmm. pivot through changes. We pivot, pivot through product innovations and cycle changes and market changes. One of those big pivots we had to do was through the COVID uh, series of events that occurred and logistics and supply chain as we move physical products on the ocean and freight and ship and they come across and go through trucks and they have logistical opportunities, let's call them, uh, to, to, to do what they do, which is get in the market and sell and eventually end up on your doorstep after you order them on Amazon in two days or less, uh, is to dealing with the price and the pivot of that entire market as we shifted as an entire country, a, a global economic shift occurred. And so many people were now stuck ordering online when they used to do a lot of retail and that just created this super hyper growth problem. But it was also an opportunity for us to really test our business because at that point, uh, a container of product in one of our brands went from $7,000 to $25,000 in cost. So we had to pivot because all of a sudden cost had just gone through the roof and the time frame to deliver the product had also went through the roof. Now, we were able to sustain that because we had great supply chain logistics and just in time inventory and freight and a very strong system of operations that allowed us to stay in product while others fell out or could simply not afford to um, withstand that much change. And so business, again, pivoting and seeing what's possible is nothing but a series of solving problems. And the longer you solve the problems, a little bit of luck happens somewhere along the way. And then you will marry some of your products uh, and brands because they're going to perform really great and others you just have to be willing to let go. And in the end, there are a lot of products in the marketplace that you can sell. Some you may have never even heard of yet. You'd have to go discover them. And that's part of the process of becoming successful. That's awesome. And I heard I heard quite a few different things because when you were talking about um, going out and testing five different products, mm -hmm. seeing, I, I, I like that idea, especially when it comes to physical products. I mm -hmm. think we can also adapt that to um, service products products as well, not necessarily going out and testing five of them, but still taking on that philosophy of testing, testing before investing. I like testing see, I before investing. Too. <laughs> I can rhyme too. Um, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I know that's something that Terry teaches. She, a lot of her clients um, don't necessarily have physical products, but have the service products. And she yeah always emphasizes that you need to know your audience and uh, yes. know what their problems are and actually speak with them directly to find out what their actual needs are before mm -hmm. you go creating something that you think is awesome. I think a lot of people marry their products before they're even tested. They do before they even go out to the market. And I would analogize that like going to, uh, you know, if Walmart just had a huge building and you walked in and there was one table with one product setting on it, would they be Walmart? And the answer is no, they have 250,000 SKUs and less than 10% of them sell 450 plus billion dollars a year in sales. So you don't think they don't know what their top SKUs are now and that they just miraculously discover that? No, they put an entire inventory set in there and over time they learned to discover what was most in demand and then used data to start putting what products at in shelves and other things should occur based on trends, demand and people's you know, interest in the product and timelines and time of year and other factors. And they simply gave the people more of what they want. Our methodology, what we call our five by five playbook is exactly the same. We set up a five structured uh, system so that you test and market five products to discover which one or two will literally make up 80% of your income. And from that point, you are now not guessing. You are simply following the data and like Apple and big companies that we follow and retail, we borrow a trick from retail, we simply sell them more of the same product in different packaging. 
So once you establish that and you go out, you may look like a brand who just discovered a single product SKU in the kitchen space and now you sell, you know, eight figures of it, but in actuality, behind the scenes were five or six or seven product types that failed to discover the eighth one that actually became a success. And from that eighth one, every product type after that was now a part of a major brand that has been selling for years and, and running past eight figures. So again, I think people miss the process and simply want the outcome, right? And they get it. They want to be over here and they want to be seen as wise, but they always skip the experience and the knowledge part to get to wisdom. And it's really easy today to be a 19 year old life coach with a blue check mark and be seen as wise when you completely skipped execution and knowledge in the process. And then what we want to get down to is there is knowledge and execution and imperfect action that must occur for knowledge to be gained and from knowledge in time and market and activity products and business will define itself it will change and pivot through there and then you will become wise and what you do because you simply have done it long enough and you can actually speak about it intelligently i love that and, and I, <clears throat> I love that you inserted imperfect action imperfect action and something perfect will happen along the way it may not happen three months or five months or three or five years from now but long enough it will happen and luck comes into business the longer you're around. Right time, right market, right product, right brand, right situation, right contract, right viral video that pops off on one of these channels. And all of a sudden you find yourself in all these crazy opportunities, maybe even a hyper growth opportunity. And it's just because you literally got there long enough to be there. And we're, we're three to five minute people these days. Actually, we're three to five second, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, six to seven used to be a great one, I think about 10 years ago, but now at TikTok, we're about three to five seconds. And if you don't hook somebody in three to five seconds, they won't spend the next 30 seconds with you. So we have short attention spans. We want things to happen in, you know, three to five minutes and three to five months even feels like a long time. And I'm going to tell you real business is done in three to five years minimum. So, you know, we're not going to talk about opium mindset, you know, guru lottery scratch and sniff mentalities today. Because that is that whole idea that everyone's floating on a dime and waiting for the next thing to happen. And instead of doing it the right way and picking up dollars, they're stepping over the dollars and picking up pennies. Ooh. And I get it because they're scarcity minded. I've been in scarcity. I, I personally have felt that, been a part of it, experienced it firsthand when I went bankrupt. And in the process of, the, of dealing with that and the methodical fallout of it was not fun. I had a, two small children and a pregnant wife. And uh, when she was about eight months pregnant, we were about to give birth and they ended up towing the van out of the house at 10 o'clock at night out of the garage because they repossessed it because it was well paid for the kids, pay for the formula, pay for life. But the van was on the back burner and eventually they came for the van. Uh, van. I had to make choices. They took everything in the van too, like all the car seats and everything and toys and they just towed the whole thing away. And it took us about two weeks in order to be able to get out back to the lot and actually get to the car and get everything out of it. Just crazy times. But if, you know, those are all, you know, what I really understood about all that, and the reason I bring it up, honestly, is that I finally discovered a, a simple phrase, and that was my opportunity began when my excuses ended. And I had mm. a million excuses for all the things I couldn't do, wouldn't do, shouldn't do, the risk I couldn't take, the fear I could have had uh, in all of that, and the fear I did feel in all of it, and felt the fear and overcame it anyways. Uh, and just had to push through back against the wall. And I think there's a lot of people that may be in that place today. Um, because they feel like money's not available or it's not there. They feel a scarcity, but in actuality, money moves. Money's like a river. It flows. And it flows around different verticals. It flows around different industries. And what you should know is it's flowing out of real estate and typical types of models uh, in the industry right now. And it is moving into high-tech AI and e-commerce. So money may not be in your position right now or in your business's position. And you may be <laughs> staring down the barrel of your number getting called and you're out on your butt from your job. But in actuality, money is flowing into other places insanely fast. Okay, it's flowing into business and development and AI. It is flowing into physical products, e-commerce, and business development side. On this side of the house, the money is flowing like insane. I can't tell you how many people are like coming to me constantly, being like, "Hey, we want to buy businesses. We want to buy businesses. Well, what kind of business? I, you know, what's the three, five, ten, twenty million dollar deals you have? They want to buy like crazy. Okay, and but yet we have this really big dichotomy in business and, and in personal lives. I read a statistic this morning that, you know, the, the, the downturn in McDonald's and other real estate, uh, other, excuse me, um, uh, food based marketplaces at that level is dropping dramatically. But on the other hand, the most Lambos ever sold in one month just happened. So there is this movement, there's a shifting, there's this monetary change is occurring. And I know a lot of people feel it 
because in many ways we are conditioned, and I was too through my years at IBM and business and corporations to be dependent on a system that can turn you up and you know spit you out. You become a number. You become a bottom line of uh, you know I'm the top performer, but I suddenly managed to get below the bottom line, and it's like well take early retirement or go to Argentina. It's like well no, I'm not doing that. I'm quitting. And I think a lot of people get put into those positions, which creates a scarcity and out of scarcity mm -hmm. comes a victim mindset and out of that comes fear. Right. At the end of the day, fear, fear of taking care of this, providing for my family, keeping the lights on. It's really easy for you to say that, Neil, now, because look at you, blah, blah, blah. But I've been there. <laughs> I've lived in those trenches. I, I know that I understand that. And honestly, at the end of the day, I give credit to God for getting me out of it. Number one. And number two, I was willing to put in the work. I was willing to do the things people were not willing to do. And because of that, I'm still here, literally. Well, and at the end of the day, I mean, we were talking earlier about sometimes getting a, a lucky opportunity. And, and yep. one of my favorite definitions of luck is when preparation meets opportunity and you still have to be prepared. In order yep. to be prepared, you need to be persistent. Correct. And that's what creates those opportunities. So you you brought up your family. Uh -huh. And you and I started a little bit of a conversation before we got started. And, and then we had to cut it short because I knew it'd be really good here. Um, part of the reason that you love what you do is you had said you like building people up and, and creating these types of entrepreneurs. And, and you happen to be creating them right in your own household. Let's uh -huh. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So when I moved out of the system, one thing I and, and what I say by that is I left my corporate career in 2007 and just burned the bridges, not in a negative way and told everybody to go take a flying leap. I just ended those relationships and said, that's it. The bridge is burnt. I'm never going back. So there was never an option for me to ever go back and get a job. Right. That was it. It was done. And with that, the reason why I changed many of those things was because my family was becoming my purpose, purpose above profit. And I learned a very valuable lesson when, when I lost everything um, for the second time in my life. I'm only 48, but I've lived two, two lifetimes. The first one I went through a very, I'll get out of that, a very bad divorce in, in six years of nonsense and two years of that getting divorced was which terrible and reset my life back to zero. And I had to start over again. And then in the process with my new wife and, and going through our life and building it up, we you know, you ran into some unfortunate financial problems and got taken advantage of in a deal that I went too far down the rabbit hole learning lesson uh, and discovered that I was financially leveraged too far. And the only thing to do is to declare a business bankruptcy and get out of that. But in the process of that, it just refined my brain, refined my brain as iron sharpens iron, if you will, and, and hardened my strength and resolve uh, on what I wanted to do. And ultimately was being pushed to feel that my purpose was my family and that I needed to put profit second. Now, it sounds weird in a world full of make money, make money, bigger house, all this stuff, you know, uh, and, the, and the idea that abundance is a some sort of social media post of somebody's you know 10 second look at their life and how everything is really perfect and they have all this stuff and you don't see everything below the surface of the iceberg but I'm, i have i decided that purpose above profit would be my thing and therefore i put my family above all other things i put my family time time with my wife time with my children above all of that so when my first child was born i was there when my second child was born i was there when my third child was born i was there when my fourth child was born i was there and i've been there every day for their lives since they were born. First one born in 2008, she's 15, she turned 16 uh, in June. And so for all their events, as much as it makes sense to be there for all activities, we've only we traveled as a unit, we've gone everywhere as a family, we homeschool them. Uh, so they're always around and we travel as we go as a family. Um, we got an event coming up in Nashville and we're all going together. Uh, and then we're gonna hit the beach afterward and hang out as a family. So I just made a purpose driven aspect that my family would be above profit. So I wouldn't travel uh, away from my family just to do a deal. I wouldn't not take my family with me just to get self gratification from something I needed to do to quote unquote forward my business. When in actuality, you know, doing that could jeopardize other aspects of my life and I wasn't willing to do it. I in uh, 17 years I've traveled less than five times away from my family from from one to two nights max. And because of that, I, you know, we are going to have been a unit of family that works and operates together and talks very differently than when I spoke or could speak to my family as a kid. My dad is 82 years old, lives just on the hilltop of Stone's Throw from us on 50 acres out here in the Ozarks together, uh, built their home and moved out here seven years ago. So we get to see my dad almost every day, which is awesome, along with my mom. Uh, and we hang out as a family unit and they get to come down whenever they want. In fact, he goes and gets the mail just so he can come hang out with us, which we love to have him do. 
Uh, it's just a reason for him to come say hi, which is super cool. But the mm -hmm. fact is, you know, through family, that has been something that has been not only comfort, but it has been an opportunity to speak into their lives as experience. So as I wrote my book and challenged my oldest daughter, if she was interested in writing, which it turns out she became interested in writing through learning about e-commerce um, and decided that she was had more interest in writing about the products than actually developing and creating them, she kind of sparked an interest in writing. And so I said, hey, just double down on that and see what you want to do. And without any like specific purpose other than conversation and intent, she spent two to three hours a day for more than a year writing her novel and it, around her homeschooling uh, studies and finishing her grade. She's two levels above normal standardization. We take them down and have them tested every year uh, by a former public school administrator who performs administration tests for public schoolers. Uh, against homeschoolers and just shows you the difference. She's two grades a level. She's actually in a college reading level uh, and she's coursing out at the at the top. She's beyond that. It's insane. The kid's super smart. She got her mom's gift. Long story short, she was self-motivated to do all of that herself. We never pushed her. In fact, we had to slow her down a little bit and be like, hey, get out. You got to get off your thing you know, for a little while and go do this. But she's officially published. It's in pre-sale and it'll be in full sale in June. And it is a wonderful novel of faith and resilience. It's called When the Stars Disappear. Uh, about a coming age story of a boy from a Western scene who, who depends on his life or in hard challenges and then restores his faith in that process. And it's actually good. I know I'm going to say this like, you know, Neil, she probably sounds like one of those horrible singers on stage and those people who push them out on, you know, American Idol and they sound like cat scratching on fingernails and <laughs> and it's like, no, I actually really critiqued her. I, I was really actually kind of hard on her. Um, because I was like, if this girl and like anything else is not meant to do this, is if this is not her bent, if it doesn't fit her profile and personality type, I want to shift her to something that does. I don't want to pour negative values into a, into a trough that are not going to reinforce something that she's actually good at and something that she should do. And even then I handed it to editors. So I hired a couple of editors and said, Hey, read this book. Tell me if this kid needs to stop or if she needs to keep going literally. And so the editors came back and said, Hey, this is great. One of them was like, I want to work with her. Um, to get this, you know, ready to publish. And so we hired the editor to help go through the book and finish the stages of the book for her together. So she was mentored by an editor to kind of learn the right phrasing and change some of the storyline and kind of critique it. And, you know, now it came to a published edition. So the other girls have watched that. I got my book out in January. Hers coming out in June. So I led um, by creating my own book. I mean, what am I as a leader if I don't do it myself? So I got my book together in the last year and had it put together and published uh, out on Amazon called Almost Adam, uh, Automated Income with FBA, better get the title right, and and showed her that I could do it and showed her the process. And so she's just following um, behind me in learning how to do it. So she's getting very passionate about writing. She's on the second part of her novel. Now that this one is out, she has a second storyline. And it's actually selling really well. It was number 18 in uh, Western fiction uh, the other day, and it is kind of holding its own on the charts on Amazon. And I'm just, I couldn't be more proud as a father if you tried, uh, you know, I'm down in all sincerity. <laughs> She's, you know, not just brag about my own kid, but I'm really impressed with her. Her an ass. Oh, looks like we froze in it. I'm not sure if it's me or Neil. Um, looking like, I hope, I hope we're still live here. Oh, there we go. Not sure who froze. Just but a little one of glitch us. in the service there. Yeah, one of us froze there. But uh, oh. yeah, at, at the end of the day, I really I love that. And I love that you're you're leading by example within your own family. And that does create the opportunity for you to be leading by example in, in the greater family out outside of you as well. So you popped your book up there for a second. What was that title again? Almost Automated Income with FBA. Uh, it talks about building a profitable, uh, profitable lifestyle-driven Amazon business, exit for millions, even without any e-commerce experience. So it actually is the culmination of a more than two years worth of podcasting um, for experts in the area of financing, business, research, development, and software all around the e-commerce world. And it ties backwards to our 5 by 5 Voltage Playbook. And so as I interviewed them, we turned them into a book. So the experts talk in line with our playbook from beginning to end. So if you're brand new and you want to learn the process and the steps of building an Amazon business, this will take you through that um, from beginning to end, not just my own voice, but case studies for my clients who wrote part of them. Some of the chapters were done by them uh, and by experts that I interviewed on my podcast. And so it talks you through the whole. Oh, and there we go. Freezing again. Darn it. I'm not sure. Again, I'm not sure if it's me. Well, or... I hear you. We got squirrel power. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, um, when you come back, if you come back, I, oh, there you are. What's FBA stand for? Fulfilled by Amazon. So if you ah. are, if you're an Amazon shopper and ever okay. had anything land on your doorstep, that is called fulfilled by Amazon and third party sellers like me, uh, can have our products shipped to the customer's door through Amazon, uh, delivering our products using their infrastructure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it comes to something like that, like I know when I search through Amazon, I can find like 50,000 of the same thing. And some of them even use the same pictures on <laughs> each of them. Um, yeah. how, how do we, how do we know that what, what we want to bring to the market is, isn't already oversaturated when mm. it comes to playing in Amazon? Well, remember, products can be saturated, uh, but brands cannot. So we focus on brand building um, okay. in which we're able to then not marry products within that brand until we discover a product that connects properly with the audience we targeted in our brand. So we have the phrase similarity plus familiarity equals trust. Similarity plus familiarity equals trust. The brand differentiator that we use is a, a couple of different things. We'll get into uh, some of it. But the end result is the way we present the product, the value of the product, even the price point of the product down from images, bullet point and copy speak to a certain level of buyer in Amazon who are more um, solution oriented and less price sensitive or review driven. So mm. they're after a particular solution. Our products are geared towards that. So we'll typically what we call a tier two seller, which is our tier two buyer is someone who is in the 50 to 200 plus range. Okay, 200 and to 400 plus would be a tier three. Many Amazon sellers and some of the saturation you see and similar products even stealing each other's images, that's Amazon's mosh pit. That is the front row where people are slamming into each other and six foot sweaty bikers are running into you and it's just this nasty little mosh pit um, that we don't like to play in and that's sub 30, sub $50 products. So we will do the sub 50 and above and we are operating in a brand to brand competition. So we're automatically presenting and seeing and putting products in the market that actually touch a different avatar uh, than a general audience that you might find on Amazon. And therefore price sensitivity is only one component of their buying. They're actually after a solution. It goes, it's kind of like this. If you go to a dentist and you got a problem, you got a toothache, you woke up, it's terribly difficult. You've been setting on it for the last three, four days and it's just, okay, that's it. I gotta get to the dentist. So you call them up and you're like, how fast can you get me in? And what's it going to cost me? And the dentist is like, hey, uh, I could get you in today. It's an hour long procedure. It's going to cost you, you know, $250. You're like, uh, okay, what well, hour? It's going to take an hour? Like this is, man, I'm hurting. He goes, okay, you know, I got another opening. This will take, you know, 15 minutes. It's going to cost you $500. Do you want that? And the person's like, yeah, 15 minutes less pain. I'll pay the 500 bucks. Can you get me in this afternoon? Yes, I can get you in. Let's go. Let's do it. So it's solving a particular pain point that the, that the buyer has in mind for the product's outcome. They know Amazon's system, they trust the leveraged authority of the system, they know the return policy if it doesn't meet expectations, no matter what price point it is. And they know that if they like the product, they're going to go look for more of them. So people that typically buy at that level are more brand driven. So as we establish products, then we know that they're going to buy more of the same product in different packaging, okay? It's like the iPhone people who buy the iPad Pro, who buy the iWatch, who got the iPhone, who got the iMac, they buy more of the same product in different packaging. And we simply follow that same trick from retail. So as we find that vertical, we go horizontal on the base, like a pyramid, and then we just build our way up to the brand. So some products will have greater life cycles, some will not. And the goal there is to move unique, innovative products in the market and create innovations that go all the way through trademark into um, design patents. Okay, so with design patents, we're able to then register a specific uniqueness to that product, mm -hmm. and it takes itself even farther into the market, and that intellectual property called IP becomes a value-added bonus in the saleability of the business. It, um, when we do that correctly, the business is worth more in the end. Okay, I like mm -hmm. that. I like that. And then I think what, what really stood out in, in a lot of what you shared, there's products can be saturated, but brands can't. And that also speaks to, um, that's what you're marrying. You're, you're marrying you. You're not necessarily marrying your products. 
That's right. We call that the circle of confidence. And when someone is identifying a product they might want to sell and asking the question, do I know somebody? Am I somebody that would buy this? Can I see myself and speak to that person who loves this cooking? She loves to do that or he loves to do this. He loves the mechanic. He loves the outdoors. He loves these things. If I have a circle of confidence, is it somebody I can speak about, even if it's myself? I'm going to start identifying patterns in that, right? Patterns of products and types and outcomes and solutions. And I bought this lure versus that one, or I love this pot versus that pot, right? I love the KitchenAid brand and I hate the Quasinar brand. And they're going to have these particular affinities about brand. Like we love to be very unique, but we're also very brand driven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I ask you what kind of car is your favorite car, you'll probably tell me you've owned two or three of them. And those you like these particular ones versus another because, you know, Hondas run longer and I put one at 300,000 miles and my family's always been in Hondas and such and such and such and such, right? So our goal is to tap into that because we know the products won't make it through the longevity, but the brands will. If you just take it to the retail world, how many different burger joints are there? Right. Right. You could throw a stone and hit a five burger joints within a radius. So the products are similar and can be seen as saturated, but the brands are what differentiate them to who goes where, Burger King versus McDonald's versus Five Guys, et cetera. And we follow that same thing online. E-commerce driven methodologies follow the same as retail. Okay, in the Bank of America Forestry Research Study, you can go check out right now online, says that by 2040, you know, we're going to be a, a inverted. Okay, what is 35, uh, 65 is going to flip. Most all transactions will be done in e-commerce. So whether you get a part of this or get involved in building a company in e-commerce, or you're simply going to be in it as a byproduct of the changing landscape of our future, we're all going to be changed by it. Like it or not, it's coming. I prefer to be on the side that says, I want to not take advantage of it, but I want to be a part of it. And I right. want to see where I can fit and grow and then take people along. So I don't work with everybody. I have my own business. I have my own brand. We have our own growth. We are acquiring companies uh, and exiting companies in the M&A side of our model. So I usually look for strong uh, business people who are more mature. They're wanting a faster retirement. They are typically done with the nine to five grind because they've been there for 15 years. They're like, hey, I'm done with this. They got some capital and know what it means to risk. Um, they're not just starting in life, but they may be starting a business, which is fine. Right. And so they understand what it means to go out for three to five years and do something in three to five years that will change their life forever so they don't have to do it again. And they also understand getting in my boat means they're going from maybe Hell Island to Heaven Island a little faster and trying to escape the sharks in the water that are out there in the process because there are sharks in the water and they could come from anywhere and everywhere. They could be your closest family members. Hey, what are you doing, dummy? Like, <laughs> you, yeah, right? I mean, that you've seen the meme with people lining up for the guy who's going down the road to his new business and everybody's lined up on the side of the road with baseball bats and pitchforks and stuff telling what a stupid person he is. Nice. And I can't tell you the number of people in life and family who either abandoned me or told me that I was dumb when I left IBM. Yeah, I guess he's laughing now, right? <laughs> well, that, that's it exactly. And I, and I love what you're offering here is it's not one of those get rich quick schemes. You yeah. have to be able to put the effort in the work and you have to want to put it that in. Correct. You want to you be, gotta want you to want... know that there's time, energy, attention and money. OK, a team effort in building a business, time, energy, attention and money. You have to be willing to dedicate all those. I ask that if anybody's interested in learning about what we do, or even starting a business of any kind, that they choose to do it, that they are not sold into doing it or convinced it's something that's going to be this miraculous wonder. You will give up at the first obstacle. You will quit at the first hurdle. The first thing that doesn't go right, you'll feel like you've made a terrible decision. We call that the emotional cycle of change. Okay, mm -hmm. And everybody goes through this emotional cycle of being excited, starting the new business, and then things don't go quite as fast as you want. And you run into a few troubles and you, you try to get a sourcing agent or you run into this problem with a manufacturer, or you're trying to get the right product selected and all of a sudden it's not going fast. And so now you get down into what we call the valley of despair. A lot of opportunists in the world of buying courses and programs and never having success get down in the valley of despair, buying more and more opportunities, but never, ever executing on them. Okay. Execution is yeah. like a ladder. You got to step up the ladder. You can put the ladder there and say, this is a really great ladder. Look at my brand new ladder. But if you never step on a freaking rung, you're never going to get to the top. So you got to climb up those rungs, right? Which is problem solving and tenacity and perseverance. You got to be willing to go up and around and over and, and maybe say, hey, you know what stupid ladder? I'm going to go rent a lift because I'm going to get on that roof one way or another. Right. Execu execution over excuses. Execution over excuses. 
Yep, and that's when the opportunity begins. And I see a lot of people that don't want to necessarily do that, but there are a group of people that do understand that, and they become great CEO operators of these companies. If it's a, what we call mm -hmm. a DISC profile, are you familiar with DISC at all, D-I-S-E? I have looked into okay. that one, yeah. Yeah, it's not the INFJ feeling good and whether or not I, you know, I have an aura about me or whatever that crap is. This is more about your business aptitude, whether, whether or not you've actually been in business. It follows similarities to Kiyosaki's four quadrants uh, mm -hmm. of growth from the nine to five to the self-employed to the business, uh, you know, entrepreneur to the business owner and then the investor. Everybody wants to jump to investor. Great. Everybody wants to go straight to a business owner. That's fine. We talked about this earlier. But if you're going to climb out of that change, whether you're in the despair because you're working a nine to five at 80 hours a week and you don't see your kids for two days, of, you know, you're working five days to see them for two, that sucks. <laughs> this, it just does. The only way to change that is to spend additional hours in the evening or daytime or the weekend and build your way out of it. Right. You're going to have to lay brick by brick. And I have guys, I got a full time pharmacist right now who's crushing it. And he now sees that in the next 12 to 24 months, he's out of the pharmacy world for good. Right. He spends 60 hours a week in a pharmacy, uh, grinding it away. He's got a wife and two wonderful little children, and he is making his pathway. He's got his products. He tested the first two. They didn't go very great. They were kind of meh. And the third one, the third one is going like crazy. Third one's going faster than he can get inventory. So now we're solving other inventory problems for growth because that's going to turn into this tremendous brand. And now he sees it. And literally within 12 to 18 months, he will be able to walk out of that business and never look back. And that's a huge love, opportunity for him. I love that. And then that, that speaks to what you said earlier about a series of solving problems. Series problems solving. just changed to something else and he's still solving them. I love that. Yeah. That's a lot. That's really still awesome. solving. We, we are actually over time. So oh, my bad. I, you know what? The conversation was so good. I wasn't going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. So, Believe it or not, I don't talk as much as the five women in my family. I do I, believe I'm that guy in my house. And <laughs> there's a lot of talking going on and I just listen most of the time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that would be me in our, in my household as well. So thank yeah. you so much for your time. Uh, okay. Again, can you pop up your book there? Sure. It's on Amazon or you can check it out on my website, um, voltagedm.com forward slash book. If you get it on Amazon, um, obviously I can get it faster KDP and paperback for Kindle, or I can save you 70% off if you go to my website and grab a $5 copy. Uh, and then get the paperback at a discount too if you go to my website and get it direct from us. So you guys can check that out. There you go. Awesome. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Lots of juicy stuff in here and uh, appreciate it so much. Thank you. I've been honored to have be a guest and I appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who's showed up here in the Facebook group to watch this live. And for those of you who are going to watch the replay and for those of you out in YouTube land, come on over to Heartrepreneurs with Terry Levine on Facebook. You're going to be able to connect with a lot of really heart-based business owners like myself, like Terry, like Neil. Have a brilliant day.